So read some of the criticism recently of AI is that it is in the hands of the big players, you know, whether it's um, Microsoft and Google developing their own AI or um, buying smaller companies or siphoning off developers. And some could say that's a good thing. We have these enormous companies who are spending enormous bu budgets on research and development that candidly other folks don't have. So can you talk about like what does productive collaboration between big tech developers and everyone else actually look like? You know, it's one of the areas where there's obviously a lot of turmoil and kind of different perspectives on this. Um, I do think here's some basic attributes. So one, it's very good for human society and for entrepreneurs and for consumers that there is a number of different companies that are competing with each other. You know, that competitive landscape, I think, creates a bunch of not just competition, but potential for collaboration. Because, you know, for example, large tech companies go, well, we want to have uh, developers and startups working in our ecosystem and our cloud. You know, how do we provide tools? So like the earliest stuff from OpenAI and Microsoft was a set of APIs in order to, to enable, you know, small companies and entrepreneurs in terms of doing this. Um, you know, there's a question around, you know, kind of a, an interest in in kind of global scale and providing uh, a set of things. You know, I do think that one of the things that is kind of most important that is happening, but gets under described in terms of what its importance is, is this kind of phrase around iterative development, which is, you know, like get stuff out there and get people to engage with it. Because if you get stuff out there and get people to engage with it, then um, that uh, helps solidify what this landscape of these are really positive possibilities and these are really things to avoid in terms of what's going on. And that iterative development is, I think, one of the things that's so important uh, in what's going on. And frequently it can get lost in a slowdown and, you know, have blue ribbon commissions before you do things, but you, you actually don't, you, you like the tools for, making this thing more of an amplification of humanity or steering towards very positive outcomes and away from negative outcomes, the tool set's richer in the future. And so all of that impulse tends to not be, uh, not to incorporate those understandings. And that's why the iterative development is very important. And, you know, obviously as James went through and in, in, in some good depth, it's important that it isn't just, you know, like for example, only people in Silicon Valley, right? Um, but like, and not just only people in the U.S., it's, you know, how do we get this to a, you know, broader scope of it? And it's one of the things that I think, you know, OpenAI has done extremely well. It's one of the things I think is happening through the entrepreneurial ecosystem. I think what a, a lot of people who are outside the technology field misunderstand is specifically the iterative deployment, because in some fields you would never put something out there until it was perfect. And this sort of idea that you were getting user feedback and iterating, how do you think that, um, is there a tension between that iterative deployment and red teaming, which is so critical in terms of safety vulnerabilities and making sure that we're putting out things that are safe for con consumers to use. Actually, quite the opposite of tension. I think there's, so, oh, there's reinforcement. It's a positive reinforcement loop because, yes, you should clearly, as per you know the Biden-Harris excellent executive order, you know, uh, have some red teaming in there. You should be considering what could go wrong and you should be red teaming. And then, by the way, you red team you do iterative deployment, you see what was right and wrong about your red teaming. You go, oh, we missed this. This was an important thing because, and we wouldn't have known it without really iterative deployment. Like one of the metaphors I've used, you said, well, we're not going to launch the automobile until we understand everything. Well, maybe we might've gotten the seatbelts before we launched the automobile, but we probably would have had a hundred other things that were completely irrelevant. And then we never would have launched the automobile. So part of the iterative deployment is, yes, you, you, you launch it, get the automobile. And then as you get the automobile, you go, ooh, seatbelts, good idea. Let's have seatbelts, <laughs> right? And so that's the that's the kind of the, the tangible metaphor for this kind of thing. And then wraps back in a red team. Like what could go wrong here that that gets better shaped um, by what you're learning from iterative deployment? So thinking, thinking of iterative deployment, you know, Google was obviously in the headlines last year. Um, when Gemini was generating from the funny, like 90% of hockey players, uh, ice hockey players being people of color and women to, you know, more, more disturbing, you know, lots of, of Nazis um, being people of color, et cetera. And so some people might say 
this was egregious. Other people might say, yeah, it was bad headlines for Google, but it didn't really hurt anyone. They fixed it quickly. Like, this is what we do. We put something out and we fix it. Like, what's your take there? So, look, it's it's definitely in the category of, you know, fender scrapes. Like, it's kind of like, yes, is it embarrassing? Yes, was it, thing? is it the kind of thing that you should have red teaming, you know, never allow to happen? It's like, well, no, that doesn't actually, in fact, you know, when I when I tend to think of like, what are the things to prevent never happening? It's things like break the entire system, cause, you know, uh, mortality or deep injury, you know, that kind of stuff. And so that's that's what you're primarily trying to do. It was a bunch of unforced foot fault errors from, you know, Google and in, in trying to do the right thing. Um, but, you know, uh, it's, it's always the storm in a teacup in these things, I think. But thinking about the right thing, you know, last week when we talked with James, we talked about, you know, what is fair. Different societies have different values on that. And you could imagine that, you know, when you're when you're asking, you know, AI about climate change, like you don't want to talk about both sides. Like you want to be like, nope, there are facts that climate change exists. There are facts that vaccines work like you don't want to get into a bad place where we're both sides and everything. Um, but on the other hand, immigration. Is immigration good for the United States? Well, you know, there's there's many smart arguments on both sides and how our system should work, et cetera. Like how how does how should that be taken into account by by big tech as they're as they're creating these very powerful machines? Well, that's funny because I do agree that there is an importance about being rigorous about truth. The easiest one is scientific method, hence vaccines, climate change, et cetera. And in that rigor about truth, you know, kind of having a cohesion and drive, even if you have political antagonists, whether those political antagonists come from economic interests or political antagonists come from religious interests or political antagonists come from cultural, you know, don't want to change anything. I mean, there's, there's a wide variety of religious sects that say, you know, we, you know, we don't believe in the germ theory of disease. You know, it's like, okay, <laughs> right. Like that's important. Now you said immigration. I actually think immigration is one of the ones where there's some just clear truths as well. Um, and so, for example, you know what is contributed to centuries of American prosperity is a set of different immigration. So I think immigration has had a historical, you know, proof point about history. Even if you look at the micro of it, let I could take a classic one for big tech is say, look, big tech's going to hire software engineers question is, do you want them to hire the software engineers in the U.S., or do you want to hire them in Canada, or do you want them to hire in India, or do you want them to hire in Europe? And the answer is, you'd rather have them hire them all in the U.S. for the rest of the U.S. society interests, because if they're paying, you know, an engineer, call it 400K a year, you know, then that engineer rents, you know, goes to restaurants, dry cleaners, lawyers, accountants, <laughs> right? Everything else, it 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 essentially onshores money that goes into the entire ecosystem for everyone. So any argument that is not trying to get every single one of these people hired within U.S. shores as possible is actually just foolishness. From a big tech perspective, to wrap back to the question, you know, big tech is going to, and you know, technology generally. They're going to hire as many technologists as they can because the you know all industries are in the process of becoming technology companies. There's the purest ones that are the furthest out edge in technology, but everything hotel companies, not just Airbnb, but like hotel companies and so forth. Everybody is in the process of becoming more and more of a technology company, and so it's super important to have that talent. And um, you know, there's there's wide swaths of of areas in the world that uh, have a whole bunch of technical talent. And the only question is, are they going to be employed there? Or are we going to get some percentage of them employed here and then benefit the entire rest of American society uh, by having them employed? So, Reed, I tend to agree with you on what you just said, but I still think you sort of sidestepped the question. There must be an area where you think it's tricky, like affirmative action or I don't know, they're, they're, like the value of independence versus communal living. Like there's just different, we have different values as Americans than maybe they hold in China or Japan or other places. Like 
do you do you do you think that affects this discussion or you know you don't you think that the facts are the facts and we actually don't need to worry about those sort of cultural differences it's both this is the complication questions around for example you know various conceptions around human rights in different kind of cultural things and what do those human rights mean in terms of you know kind of you know agency and control over your data or individual versus group and so forth and you know part of the shape that we are navigating here and the shape that's, you know, building technology and all the rest, you know, comes that. Now, I think there are really important issues there. And I think there's important issues to learn from. You know, so for example, as a American, there's a whole bunch of things that I think are super important within, you know, kind of the way that America, American values have some areas where they're a beacon of leadership, you know, individual freedoms, do your best work, democracy, you know, with the exception of Trump and January 6th, peaceful transition of power um, in in kind of voting, you know, like these kinds of things I think are are valuable. But I learn intensively from China, from India, from Europe in things that, you know, part of the basis of, oh, here's the way that even we as America and we as humanity as a society should improve. And you should ultimately take that kind of learning mindset. And that's part of the reason why, like, I wasn't, it's, you know, to me, it's kind of like, well, look, these differences are an opportunity to learn and an opportunity to, 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 to have, you know, uh, effective cognitive tension. I still have this kind of belief that we will sort out to a, with a zone of truth. Like, I tend to think that individual human rights are really important, even if you have a society that says, no, they're not. It's like, no, actually, in fact, I think they are, Right. Uh, and I think they're manifest even if you don't see them in the behavior patterns that you see. But by the way, counter like, you know, one of the reasons I frequently call myself pro-individual anti-libertarian um, is like actually, in fact, uh, how we we come together as a society is really important, too. And that's part of the reason, like in my first book, The Startup of You, I said it's like I to the we. It's I and we both matter. And, you know, the I or we. It's like, no, no, no. I and we. And it's kind of key. So. I love it. Possible is produced by Wonder Media Network. It's hosted by Ari Finger and me, Reid Hoffman. Our showrunner is Sean Young. Possible is produced by Katie Sanders, Edie Aller, Sarah Schleed, Adrian Bain, and Paloma Moreno Jimenez. Jenny Kaplan is our executive producer and editor. Special thanks to Surya Yalamanchili, Saida Sepieva, Ian Ellis, Greg Beato, Ben Rellis, Parth Patil, and Little Monster Media Company.